So let's give ourselves a, a little chance to see whether or not I'm telling the truth on this stuff. So what I'm going to do, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to get um, two volunteers. And what they're going to do is they're going to put together this little five-part part product. It's a door, okay? Um, it's a door that came from, uh, from a company that is no longer in business. It's, um, it's uh, sad, but it does happen. And the reason that they're no longer in business, this is one of the reasons, but um, the reason they're no longer in business is because they, uh, instead of trying to fix the problem, they decided what they needed to do was fix blame. Fixing blame is uh, something that, uh, that we find a lot here in uh, the Detroit area. Um, there's one company in particular that um, search for the guilty seems to be the, uh, the absolute best way to get the job done. So today what we're going to do is we're going to ask uh, two volunteers, one, two. See, I didn't have you. Yeah. So anyways, one, two. Can we come uh, bring our volunteer? Oh, let's give them a big round of applause for uh, volunteering. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to train the volunteers, and then I'm going to ask them to put them together. Now, I'll need another volunteer, somebody who's got a watch or, or their phone or something like that, because um, we're ultimately going to need to time these guys. So first, what do you do first when you've when you got a new operator? Show them the rope. Process? Train them. Yes, that's uh, we call it training. So, anyways, here's the deal. There's a door. There's a spring. Put the spring in that little cup right there. See, mm -hmm. very graciously. Oops, very graciously uh, uh, given to you by the product design engineer. Then you just um, you just. Did I just? No, I didn't. Oh, phew. for a second there, I thought I'd uh, I'd uh, made a mistake, but I was wrong. Anyways, um, so then we put the, the, the latch on, then put the washer on. Now, <clears throat> the temptation is to take the screw, put it through the washer, and then screw it in. Uh, don't do that, um, because number one, you'll screw up my product, and number two, it won't work anyway. So, and then, not only we would have a, you know, 1700 RPM torque monitor angle-coated uh, rundown tool, which would automatically feed the screw, but today, just screw that in with your hands. When you get it down, check for quality, right? Deming would be so proud. Okay, so now, now that I've uh, successfully chained these guys, trained them, um, now what we need to do is have them put it together. But again, we have to identify how much time it's taken them to do the job. Now, I will tell you as well, don't lose those springs. I can't get any more. Alrighty, are you ready, um, timekeeper? So whenever you yell it out, um, they'll go. Okay, so while they're doing that, I think they'll be doing it for a while. Let's go back to uh, like this little chart here. So <clears throat> on this chart, we know that they're going to start off slow. But we know that as time goes by, they'll get down to the break-even point, And that's when we'll start making money, right? <laughs> you get a high achievement award. Very good. Don't stop the clock. It's got to be two, two things. So we, we'll see that th there'll be a break-even point there. Now, this is um, a funny chart. It's, it's called, no, that ain't working. <clears throat> well, I didn't check Try it again. Uh, no, it, uh, see, uh, inspection is really important. So anyway, what do we call this kind of a chart when we, we're trying to get the, uh, get the operators up to speed? It's called a learning curve. A learning curve. And does it, does it work? Very little. Okay, well, let's stop the clock anyways. So how much did we get for two assemblies? 21.4 seconds and no, then 54.9. 54.9 because... Why? Because at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> we're looking at the assembly line. And if one guy is holding up the assembly line, then the slowest number becomes the number you have to live with. 54.9. Hmm. 
What was your name again? Anyhow, <laughs> anyhow, this is, oh, thank you very much. You can definitely take a seat and then some. But we can learn a lot from our friends here at uh, this now defunct company. We can learn a lot. The, uh, uh, the thing that we might want to learn first is um, why is it that uh, Adam had a hard time putting the product together? The, uh, the lever actually doesn't have good lead in around this, the captured uh, spring. There's some yeah. kind of shift it around and get it over it. Well, there's an... Is terrible. What's that? <laughs> well, here's the... And you cross it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Take him off the uh, bonus list. Okay, so anyway, um, two things happened. One... When you tried to put it together, you were doing it blind, and you crushed my spring. That's why I took yours apart. And that, that part come in right here, and that's a real problem. But there was another thing that I saw both of you do, and you did it inadvertently. See the pocket there, and there's a pocket here. And when you guys were coming up, you were going, oh, uh, and that's called polka yoke. This is a polka yoke problem, a designed-in polka yoke problem. At the end of the day, these kinds of problems are the kinds of problems that the guys on the factory floor have no control over. And, quite frankly, um, it's one of the reasons why we get, in a, on occasion, um, poor quality products. So let me put that back together. Oh, look, it really works much better now. At the end of the day, this kind of a design um, inherently will give you poor quality. But... But what happens inside the factory? This is what happens. So well, let, me, let me go through a little bit further, and then I'll talk about the, the factory itself. So poke yolk, I, I've already talked about that. What we want to do is we want to see exactly what's going on here. So we have five parts, two reorientations. It costs a buck and a half, and it, and it, and it rattles. Not only that, they fall apart because screws are not threaded fasteners are really threaded unfasteners. We designed them at a 60 degree angle so they wouldn't lock in place. We wanted to be able to take it apart because at the end of the World War II they made the decision that we need to be able to take our crappy products apart faster so let's make a 60 degree angle. The stuff that came out of England and whatnot that was tough because it had an Acme thread or a Whitworth thread and that was a locking angle. It would go down but it took a, a gorilla to get it to pieces. We should have gone in the other direction. We should have gone and made better products, but <clears throat> another big long story is about the whiz kids out of Harvard and the reasoning behind everything they did. Uh, but right now, I don't have time to, uh, to even spell MBA. So at the end of the day, we're looking at how much time it took, but what are the other things that happen inside of a product or inside of a company, when the product is um, inferior. Well, what usually happens is everybody goes through a cost reduction exercise. Now, some of you guys have probably never worked at another place, but uh, I know that Adam has, and I know that I have. And I know that everybody goes in these things and they do like a value analysis, or they do a cost reduction exercise. So. That's what these guys did. So the first thing they did was they said, uh, well, let's have a look at these parts. <clears throat> let's go and buy cheaper screws. Let's go and buy cheaper washers. Let's go and buy cheaper springs. Let's go and squeeze this guy. Look at all the, he's the guy that's making all the money. He's the guy that's selling us our pellets. So let's start there. So the purchasing agent drags in the guy who's selling the pellets and he says, hey, <clears throat> We need you to reduce your price by 15%. The guy says, oh, I can't do that. That's our profit margin. That's it. Take it or leave it. 15%. The guy says, I got to talk to my boss. He goes back to the boss and says, boss, we got to re reduce our pellet cost by 15% or we're going to lose the contract. The boss takes a cigar out of his mouth and says, no problem. Puts the cigar back into his mouth. What do you mean no problem? We just won't dry the pellets. That gives 15% extra weight. Does the purchasing agent care about that? No. Why? 
because it doesn't affect him, he did his job, his job in isolation. The parts, the pellets, now start showing up at the factory. What happens? Well, number one, the utility costs start to ramp up. And why is that? Well, because I have to draw the pellets down in order to shoot the product. But the guys on the factory floor are saying, hey, we still gotta, we gotta make parts. So they start shoving them through. And when there's water, you get things called steam voids and knit lines. So the quality is getting worse instead of better. And the production volume is going down. But the big boss is taking the purchasing agent out for a high achievement award. Purchasing agents on a roll. What about these other parts? These other parts that we're buying? No problem. So he brings in the guys and they look around and he said, hey, <laughs> we, can get these, uh, we can get these screws from Chile and, we, and we'll get them for cheaper. And we can get these, uh, these washers. We can get them from, uh, from uh, Taiwan. They've got a great big sale going on. So the Chilean, uh, the Chilean screws though show up. Oh my God, they're, they're different. They're not the same. They're not the same metric. So what do you do? Oh, you got a bunch of guys chasing the threads. They, they send them through a little machine and it, it, it changes the thread. Off standard labor, but they're still getting the, the product out the door, right? And then the washers show up. No hole. Oh, you wanted holes in those washers. Oh, that's an extra price, right? You guys think this is all kind of like I'm kidding, right? I don't kid. How do we get the springs cheaper immediately? No change at all in the spring. You don't heat treat them? No, they're heat treated. You buy in bulk. You thought I made this up, didn't you? You thought nobody can be that stupid, but nope, you're wrong. See this? See that big, great big giant box? What do you think the operator does when he tries to get a, a spring out? He grabs a hold of that big ball, he shakes it. Looks upward, of course. Shakes it. Whatever falls out, that's what God wants him to use. What happens to the rest of that ball? Into the scrap bin. Know why it's so fuzzy? Because the purchasing agent took the picture. And she was laughing so hard, because we talked about springs tangling and nesting, she was laughing so hard she couldn't really hold the camera still. You thought I was kidding. Companies get put out of business every day because they've got too many parts, too many operations, too focused on saving money, and not enough focus on where does the money actually get spent and why. Peace cost is the great American mirage. This was invented um, basically uh, during the, or just after the war years, and it was invented by, uh, by Harvard. And that's one of the reasons why I throw Harvard under the bus continuously, because peace cost means nothing. It's a resultant. What you need to do is find out what's a driver, not a resultant. That comes with whatever you've got. What you need to find is that driver. <clears throat> you want to forget about peace costs and you want to look at a total accounted cost. And people don't like to do that because it takes extra work. And if it takes extra work, then I, then you start hearing whinging, whining, and all the other stuff that goes along with it. <clears throat> we have to try and get around that. And that's where we start looking at this. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to try and figure out how we can save this company who's been doing that, by the way, for 15 years. That, that product was 15 years in the marketplace. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick up our little card and we're gonna say, <clears throat> looking at this, how many parts have to move? How many parts have to be a fundamentally different material? And then get rid of anything that looks like a spring or a screw or a belt and I'm going to give you five seconds, what they couldn't do in 15 years, to give me the number of parts that were going to be needed to make that thing and put it into the marketplace at a higher quality and a lower cost. Are you ready? 
One, two, three, four, five. How many parts do we need? Two. Two. I just happen to have them in my pocket. Why was it so easy for you to come up with a two-part design and so difficult that they couldn't do it in 15 years? Because I challenged them, or I challenged you, to come up with a new design. Now, <clears throat> that, that old design went to, the old design had to go to Japan because, I mean, American workers are just useless, right? Everybody knows that. So um, this design was what uh, the Japanese came back with. And, um, and we luckily have two Japanese guys to put them together. One, two. Can we have our two Japanese workers come back up here and give them a big round of applause? It's so good to have volunteers. All right, are you ready? See that big bump? It goes through the big hole. See those two slots? They go over these two tabs. Drop, push. Are you ready? 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 Well, you got it, but it was a struggle. How many seconds? Three and 12. <clears throat> Three and 12. Well, we're going with a 12. But still, quite a bit of a difference. Now, you'll see that what Adam did was, was he decided he was going to do things different. And that's why that thing wouldn't work. But if you just drop it and push it, it's done. So. One of the things that we found is that um, with even this product, there's going to be something different that happens. Ellen, thank you so much for volunteering, and uh, you've done a fine job at making me look good. Okay, <clears throat> so so let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about um, what we've got here. Let's talk first about about what happens um, what happened in this factory. So what would happen is two guys would be working on this and, um, and they would start to make money for the company. The problem is that um, one guy was slower than the other and the guy that was going faster decided, I'm quitting, find another job. So now what happens is your knowledge base goes back up here. So they hired another person, Kim. And Kim and Adam started working together and Adam showed her the ropes and suddenly they're down here. Now we're really making money. But Kim and Adam are kind of getting chummy. It's kind of like love at, at first assembly. And uh, so what happens? Well, they decide to open a taco stand. And now you're going to think, oh, he's just making that up. No, I'm not. It's impossible to make this kind of stuff up. And that's precisely what happened. Now we look down here. So let's say you start off at 12 seconds. How much faster do you think you put the second one together? Um, eight seconds. Bet you it's faster. How fast for you? Three seconds. Three seconds is what you're going to do the second one. It's going to go like that and like that. You're not going to get it any faster than that. See this? This isn't a learning curve. This is stupid, bad design. See this? That's not a learning curve. That's not a learning curve. That's a good design. If you have to, if you have, to have something and you walk into your boss's office and say, well, the learning curve isn't quite working or I can't get the product out the door fast enough because the operators are too stupid. It's not the operators. It's a bad engineer. So with that in mind, we look at this and we say, why in the world, why, what, how, how much difference could there possibly be here? Well, there's a thing called the ripple effect. And I'm telling you what, when you start looking at any product, and we've looked at everything again from Barbie to the space station, every product has the capability of dropping, dropping significantly the amount of effort or the amount of parts and the amount of money that it takes to get the job done. 
this is what we kind of looked at over here. So these are the five pieces at $2.50. Two parts for a buck. Same function, same number of parts, cost down, but this one's got a quality improvement. And the quality improvement, we figured it out when we were working with the General Motors. I showed this and a guy, an expert in the uh, class, <clears throat> said that um, this is gonna fall apart before that. And he bet me, oh man. It's not good to bet against Sandy. Um, I'm uh, kind of like, I'm always looking for, I'm always looking for the good bet. So I said, not only will I bet you, I'll bet you on longevity. This thing, we, we had a little cycler. All it was was just a little wheel goes around and, and a little knob that would make this go up and down. And we had that cycler running and after three weeks, this thing here had come undone. The screw fell out and it was, it was cooked. And I had worked it out so that at the beginning, if he won, I'd give him a hundred bucks. If I won, it was a dollar for every day that that survived over this. Guess who had a great big giant paycheck after six months, this thing was still cycling. The wings were all white, but it was still working. <clears throat> it's not good against, I, 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 I'm, I'm very good at, uh, at sure things. I don't bet for, for free. And uh, that guy, well, you can't expect me. Oh yes, I can. Dig down and bring out that cash book. So anyway, at the end of the day, this is the kind of stuff that can make a huge difference. Let's look at the next thing. Let's look at the factory that this is all done in here. Here's the original factory. So you had purchasing, shipping, the boss. You had, a, you had an injection molder, you had an assembly line, and then you had all the shipping and receiving that was done over here in a kind of like a warehouse. So how does this thing work? Well, the operator will stand in front of the mold machine. It'll close, it'll open. Two parts will fall out. One will be the, um, the door and the other one's the latch. She takes that throws the latch in one box, the door goes in the next box. When it's full, somebody comes along, picks them up with a forklift truck, and takes it to the, to, the, to the warehouse. Meanwhile, the purchasing agent is buying the springs, the washers, and the screws. They come into receiving, they also go into that box, or into that bin. Then you've got, over here, a couple of industrial engineers that created the new layout and the new facility for making those parts. So he's got, um, he's got uh, uh, like uh, just-in-time delivery systems, only more, no more than an hour of uh, assembly uh, componentry on the line. Um, the workstation is ergonomic. The operator um, has a right size stool and whatnot. She reaches up in a bin and she takes out a door. She takes out a spring, puts the latch in place, puts the washer down, runs it down. She does have an auto feed run down tool. She runs it down shoves it through a little slot in the door. And the little slot is for uh, a bag that has to go over because this is a Phillips screw. And eventually it'll start to tail off and it'll scratch everything that's, uh, that's there. So camming out is a real problem with these things. It goes through the slot, goes into the bag, it's sealed and cut off and drops into a shipping box and then the shipping box is taken and brought to the, uh, brought to the uh, uh, shipping, shipping area. So let's talk about the new design. So the operator is standing in front of the machine. The doors, or the machine closes, the mold closes, mold opens, two parts fall out, and she picks the two parts up, clicks them together, and throws them in the shipping box. That, that is where the money is made. That's why you design in for automation, you don't try and do it at the end. That's why you look at every component to figure out how you can take cost, weight, or even the component itself out and throw it away. This is a good example, a really small example, but a good example of what Monroe does for a living. So let's see what Elon says. Simplify and optimize the design. This is the most common error of a smart uh, engineer is to optimize something that should not exist. Don't get caught in a mental straitjacket. It's amazing. Uh, and when I read this article the other, the other week, I knew I had to do this. I knew it because quite frankly, 
everything that Elon says is what we've been saying for years. The only difference is he actually made it happen. And most of our other customers, well, Sandy, I really don't understand. That's one of the problems with most companies. Strongly held rules and regulations that say, no, I don't want to make profit. I want to go out of business. So while we're talking about that in that, uh, that speech that he, or the little quotation, that's only a part of it, only an excerpt. He also talked about quality. So Edward Darming said, this variation is reduced, quality will increase. Have a look at this. This is, um, this is really kind of amazing to me. We, um, uh, we worked with, uh, with Chrysler for a long time. And this, with the spring and this extra piece in here, and then this piece that goes over the top, and then this piece here, and then that piece there, and then the wiper. This one, one piece. Everything's in one piece except for that. This is the wiper. We brought that to Chrysler. We showed it to them. They looked at it. We had tons of background that says how much cheaper it is and how much better it'll be. But it didn't go in, even though it saved them a ton of money. What? Why? Part count was reduced by 75%. Weight went down by 50%. Four parts. I mean, I don't get it. Why, why is that? What the heck happened? What happened was strongly held rules and regulations. Oh, we've always done it this way. We can't change. You don't understand. What I do understand is that when strongly held rules and regulations come into play, logic goes out the window. So, another, another good example of uh, what I think is, um, is, um, is old fashioned, but, but at the end of the day, the right thing to do is uh, something that I, um, um, E.G. Toyota told me. He said, Sandy said, our current success is the best reason to change. We must be permanently dissatisfied in order to succeed. Now, the Toyota under him is vastly different than the Toyota under his son or grandson. The reason is real simple. The grandson or son went to Harvard. He has a financial mind. And if you go to Harvard, that's what you wind up with, is a financial mind. And that's great if you want to count the cookies that you've got in the cookie jar. It's tragic though, because if you're not doing what he says, then that means you're not investing because you don't want to take a cookie out of that cookie jar and, and see if you can trade it for more cookies. You just want to hoard those cookies. This is the way you should think. This is what made Toyota great. And unfortunately, they're not so great right now. So let's have a look at another re-engineering project. And I will tell you a little bit about this. Um, we only use old stuff because anything that's brand spanking new, our customers do not want us to talk about until it's discovered in the marketplace. This one is old. I can't remember how old, but this is an old product. Um, it was sent to us by Alan Mulally because they were losing their money left, right, and center. When we analyzed the whole product, we identified $2,000 in cost reduction. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't put all that money in. And again, because there was strongly held rules and regulations, strong pride that was associated to the design that a bunch of engineers had inherited. Let's look at the, uh, the product. So this <clears throat> right here is a battery tray. This is a battery tray right here. This is the Ford battery tray. It was, um, it was in the Ford Taurus, and this was the corporate standard. It's similar to the corporate standard. Every one of them were slightly different, but this is the corporate standard everybody has to design to. We, uh, we analyzed that. Now, when we analyze a product, um, we use a, a software package, and it has a bunch of questions in it. There's a little card here. I haven't got time to explain, but in essence, a little card there that says um, um, whether or not um, uh, whether or not first off does it have customer value that's the part value challenge and it also identifies what type of an operation it is 
what type of a part or, uh, or subassembly, what have you, is it is. And in here, if it turns out that it doesn't have value, um, it turns red. So we look at this, and this only has one part that's green. That means it's worthwhile. So how do you put this thing together? Well, first you take this steel bracket and you bolt it to the inside of the car and you got a J-nut, a well-nut, and two bolts. Then over here you, you install the upper tray. And the upper tray has a nut and four bolts plus the tray itself. And then there's a stud that's sitting on top of the, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, lower bracket that's also holding the, uh, the alternator. And um, that stud is, uh, is kind of like in a precarious position. I'll talk about that later. All these things here are showing how the product is together, put together. But because of something we noticed over there, we found that we were going to have to create something, or the computer created something called a scrap map. That meant that there was an issue that was so dramatic on this product that it was going to cause a lot of consternation on the assembly line. So this is what we came up with. This was the design that, uh, that we uh, presented to Ford Motor Company. And we said that if you put this into place, you'll save yourself about $2.2 .2 million. It turned out that it was even more than that, but it, it, it's, it's, it showed that you could save a lot of money and that scrap map went away. So what was the reason for this? Well, this is made out of steel and that's made out of brass. And when you shoved it over the top of the stud, it stripped off the, uh, the, the threads. When the operator went to put the nut on top of the threads that was for that bracket, he couldn't get them on. And you're not allowed to reef them down or modify the, uh, the, the threads so that meant I had to take the assembly out. Then I had to take out the alternator with the stud in it, put another one in, and then put it all back together. Pretty expensive, okay? This one here saves 63% of the parts are disappeared, 52% less labor, 48% less weight, 65% less cost, and 108% better quality. Um, as Dr. Deming says, variation, uh, as variation is reduced, quality will increase. Well, here's kind of like what initially happened. So we showed them um, an alternate with a new technology. And they rejected it. The engineers rejected it soundly. Then we uh, brought in the quality data. And all of a sudden, now there was a huge business case. But engineers are not graded on the quality of the product that, they have, that the operators have to build with. What a clever idea. Well, that's because of silos. That's the way we like to have things. I'm in this silo. I play within this little play box. And when I'm done with a toy, I just throw it out. And it goes to another play box. And I don't have to worry about it. The sandbox design is like incredibly stupid, but that's the way it is. So we brought this to their attention. We showed them how much money they could make, and it was rejected by their engineers. But the engineers can't really trump the vice president. So the guy that was, uh, that was in charge of worldwide engineering for, for, uh, for, for Ford, he found out about it and he implemented it. This is the chart. This is what, oh, I forgot to show you. This is the new Ford corporate standard. It's all made out of one piece. It's all made out of a piece of plastic. Sixteen parts to six. Actual time went down by 52%. <clears throat> Steps went down by 55%. Fasteners by 64%. Pokey oak issues we got rid of completely. Um, weight dropped by 48%. Piece cost went down by 71%. 40% less labor. 
100% Q burden elimination. So every one of those assemblies costs 59 cents because of the stupid tolerance stack up that they had on the, uh, on the original design. Uh, total cost went from $14.03 to $4.62. We had an investment cost on the original one of um, $476,000. We had to modify the, um, the plastic injection molding. That cost $85,000 for an annual savings of uh, $2.351 million. First time right, nine, almost 10% first time right. Over here, 99.96. Sigma 3.61, Sigma 5.65. That's the difference between conventional wisdom or thinking as Elon Musk said through analogy all the time and doing it slightly different, challenging yourself to get the job done. So accelerate the time cycle, go faster, but don't go faster until you perfected the first three steps. Doing a wrong-headed process, uh, simply stop. If you're digging your, your grave, don't dig faster. How, how did this get implemented? Once the vice president found out that this was going to take two years, he got involved and it took two months. Two months, that product, the, uh, the, the mold went out it had to be modified, it was modified immediately, and, um, and brought back and went into production. Because he understands money, and he understands good engineering. Paul Mascarenas was a real loss to, uh, to, to Ford Motor Company. So, why did this, why did the person who had this not want to go to this? And that's because of the ugly baby syndrome, okay? So this mother comes along to you and says, what do you think of my child? What do you say? Oh yeah, nice, he has your eye, right? But what do you think? You have an ugly baby, right? And this is the ugly baby syndrome, but we can learn a lot from the ugly baby syndrome, okay? So let's, let's, look, let's look at the lessons learned. So let's start at the beginning. How do you get an ugly baby? Three, two, one. Maybe you get the wrong team together, huh? What do you think? Yeah, you have to get in early at the concept phase with the right team. Get in as early as you possibly can because it's important that the right team is doing the right things. The next one you have to do is you have to remember that it's a one-way trip. You don't like what you see, it don't go back. And that's the same thing with product design. It's a one-way trip. If there's a problem, it's going to get fixed by the folks on the floor. They'll turn to tribal knowledge to make sure that they can get the job done, and that'll add to the cost of the hidden factory. Now, I will tell you that they're not supposed to do it, but I know a lot of guys did. All they did was they took the, uh, the nut and put it into a driver, and they ran it down, and who's going to get that off? I don't know, but probably not me. That, that's kind of like the tribal knowledge that they'll do to get the job done. The factory will adopt the ugly baby as theirs, and they'll resist any changes. Anyone who's ever seen someone with a, um, with a child who has issues and whatnot knows that, that that parents, those parents, are overly protective, hugely protective. You, you, uh, you, you say anything wrong or do anything wrong in front of their kid, and you better get ready for the fight of your life. And that's exactly what happens when you get into a factory who's adopted the ugly baby and then they come back and they say, don't touch it. You had your chance, get out of here, engineer. And then an ugly baby design doesn't hang around for 18 years. But what's different about Tesla is they don't let ugly babies hang around. They don't, they don't get invested. As soon as they see that there's something that could change for the betterment of the whole car company, boom, they change. That's what's different about Tesla. And that's why when you look at the ugly baby syndrome and you look at a Tesla, it defies the psychology of engineering. They're always looking for how they can get rid of ugly babies. And that means that they're also looking at how do I get rid of sacred cows? Sacred cows make the best steaks. 
When you hear someone say, we can't change that, we have to do it that way, that's a sacred cow. That means you've got to start sharpening your, sharpening your skill set using lean design and you, you're going to carve it up and you're going to have dinner and it's going to be a fat cow. The other one is, how do I talk to executives? I tell them that um, the farmer wants bacon and eggs. Some of you might be committed. Some of you are only going to make a contribution. If you're a chicken, you lay an egg and call it a day. If you're a pig, your bacon is on the line. Now, let me give you an example or two that, of people who are successful at putting things into place. So when you look at this, you can see that we went from $1,046 down to 997 bucks. The investment actually went up a bit, but the annual savings also annual savings of almost 200,000 and that's on just a seat. If you look at the BMW um, a Mini, that was a classic of, of absolutely brilliant leadership, um, both, on the, uh, both on the Rover side and also on the BMW side. If you look at Chrysler, we did a lot of work with Chrysler. The minivan won every award under the sun, in, in, including Five Star Crash. And here's a note from Jack Dolan, who used to be in charge of that group. Thanks, Sandy. It all started at your place. You want to look at our favorite example? This is, uh, this is a 20, 20, 2019, 2020, 2021 Jeep Wrangler. Or, not Jeep Wrangler. Uh, Ram truck. And um, if you look here, in 2020, it won Luxury Vehicle of the Year. Who would have ever guessed that that would have beat out a Bentley or a Rolls Royce or a Maybach? If you look at other things, so say you're into aircraft, Monroe helped uh, Boeing with the 787 considerably. Um, we got in at the concept phase. We did workshops. We did studies. We brought in all kinds of new technologies. We made mo all the sketches that you see up there are sketches that were made by Monroe people. At the end of the day, that, that plane beats out everybody. This is kind of like what it looked like if you look at small sections of the, of the aircraft. And this, this mapping and whatnot is what we did, not after the plane was built, whoops, not after the plane was built, but long before, when we're still looking at the sketches trying to develop how we're going to try and do the job. And by the way, as far as specifications are concerned, you cannot believe how many unhappy spec writers were on this project because they were continuously told, no, we're not doing it that way. Here's the new specification that we're going to go with. So what were the outcomes? Um, this is from Pete Gard, who used to be the guy in charge of interiors. We made statements to the airlines regarding the interior installation times. We're targeting 232 hours relative to the 3,500 hours that's on the 777 today. That, car, that plane makes money and lots of it. So some people will say, well, yeah, but we don't do that. We do mundane things. This is a good example of, um, of a uh, three-wheel truck. Before it was crap, afterward, basically uh, old and ugly to proud. And tons of savings. This is off one small assembly. Tons of savings. So at the end of the day, you have to make up your mind. Do you want to be a save money company or a make money company? So a save money company is running scared, has short term objectives, makes cuts in labor and materials. Um, few um, upfront analytical methods. Timing charts, mentality, reactionary mode, and they're all hip shooters. If you're a make money company, you invest time and money, and you have long-term goals, you have the attitude to lead the market, not coming in second and better dressed. Analytical approaches, like the one I just talked to you about. Very little politics, and most, well, I can tell you, the make money companies, Monroe has all their customers, all our customers make money. I'm going to skip that one and that one. So what I want to do is to wrap this up. I just want to say, if you want to get to the cheese, you can do it two ways. You can try and go through the, the maze. And um, as Elon Musk uh, said, 
he did exactly that. He tried to go through the maze. He did everything backwards. Or you can use the Monroe method. Chew through the walls and get the job done. Get the cheese the Monroe way. Anyway, thanks for very much for watching. Um, if you have a mind, please uh, subscribe. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon about what I think is going to be the um, shrinking, the big shrinking that you're going to see with the OEMs. And we're hopefully going to get that uh, to you next week. Thank you much. Bye-bye.